It makes perfect sense to read the New Testament in its current order. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, introduce us to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The book of Acts gives us the early history of Christianity, ending with the career of Paul. The letters of Paul and the other apostles, Peter, John, James, and Jude, come next. And the mysterious book of Revelation provides a climactic finale to the whole. It all makes perfect sense, unless one is a historian. Historians read the New Testament backward. Over the last 150 years, they have made a significant discovery. If the New Testament writings are ordered chronologically, according to the dates the various books were written, a wholly different picture emerges with radical and far-reaching implications. Historians dissemble these various sources in an attempt to understand them in chronological order. They focus on a precise set of questions. Where do we find our oldest and most authentic materials? How and when were they passed along, edited, and embellished? Who is involved in this process? And what theological motivations were operating? As it turns out, this seemingly destructive process of disassembly yields positive and fascinating results. I want to return to the question of what happened following the death of Jesus. Now that we have Paul as our master key, when we attempt to analyze the four New Testament Gospels with their narratives of the empty tomb, an entirely different perspective opens up. Understanding Paul turns out to be fundamental to understanding what the earliest followers of Jesus most likely experienced. The central affirmation of Paul's message and apostleship, namely that he had, quote, seen, unquote, Jesus raised from the dead, can be placed in its proper historical light. And looking at the Gospels, chronology turns out to be remarkably fruitful as a starting point. There's no absolute guarantee that what is early is more accurate than what came after. But unless we begin the process of disassembly and comparison, we have no way of even approaching our questions. Evangelical Christian scholars, both Protestant and Catholic, believe that the only possible explanation for the empty tomb is that God raised Jesus physically, bodily from the dead, and that he emerged from the tomb fully and miraculously restored to health. In other words, corpse revival or resuscitation. They maintain that there's no other logical explanation for all the facts as reported, and are quite keen to uphold Jesus' resurrection as the solid, demonstrable bedrock of Christian faith. So think of Gary Habermas's recent work. I think it's going to run two volumes, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Here's the essential affirmation that we hear. The disciples were in great despair over Jesus' death, having lost all hope that he could be the Messiah. After all, a dead Messiah is a failed Messiah. None of them was expecting Jesus to die, much less rise from the dead. So how were they suddenly transformed from disappointed hopelessness to dynamic faith? Rather than wither away, the Jesus movement began to mushroom, gaining strength in numbers as the apostles proclaimed all over Jerusalem that they'd seen Jesus alive and his tomb was empty. How can such a dramatic change three days after Jesus' death be explained any other way? And what's more, why were the apostles willing to face persecution and even death if they were spreading a story they knew to be false? I remember in college when people would try to evangelize you they would put out the idea that the followers of Jesus were either lying 
deceived or telling the truth. And then they would eliminate the first two options by a certain kind of logic. And therefore, Jesus must, in fact, have been raised from the dead. That was very convincing, I think, to a lot of people, and it still is. But it overlooks some important historical information on how we have the materials that we have, because they don't all speak with one voice. There are a limited number of non-supernatural explanations to explain what might have happened. The oldest explanation, that the disciples stole the body to deliberately promote the fraudulent claim that Jesus had been raised from the dead, is mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew as a rumor that was spread among the Jewish population. You'll find that in Matthew 28, 13 through 15. A second explanation, that some unknown person with no connection to the disciples, usually said to be a gardener, removed the body, also shows up in some later Jewish texts. The earliest source for this story is Tertullian, a late third century Christian apologist. He writes that some Jews were claiming that a gardener upset that crowds visiting Jesus's tomb were trampling his vegetables, reburied the body elsewhere, never revealing the location. In more recent times, the so-called swoon theory, popularized by Hugh Schoenfield's 1965 bestseller, The Passover Plot, suggested that Jesus was not really dead, but unconscious, either through a drug or from the trauma of crucifixion, and that he revived in the tomb. I still get emails after all these years. I remember Schoenfield published his book, let's see, I said 65, and I was flying on a plane once at that point. I was in college, and I remember walking down the aisle of the plane to go to the restroom, and I saw five, ten people, you know, airport reading. They're on the plane reading the Passover plot. It reminded me later of what happened with the Da Vinci Code. It's like the whole country, the whole world was reading the Passover plot. But I still get emails from people saying, well, you know, maybe that happened. Maybe Jesus survived the cross. And there's a major sect of Islam that does endorse that idea and claim that he ended up in Kashmir and is buried there. Some of you know of that theory. The most common explanation among biblical scholars is that Mark, our earliest gospel writer, invented the entire burial and empty tomb story to bolster faith in the resurrection of Jesus. It is Mark's invention lacking any historical basis, according to this view. I find this last explanation highly unlikely since it is hard to imagine the early followers of Jesus relating his death on the cross, but then saying nothing about what happened to his body. It would essentially be a story with no ending, but perhaps more to the point, Paul, our earliest source, written decades before the Gospels, knows the tradition that Jesus was at least buried. Remember 1 Corinthians 15? I covered that recently in a YouTube video. I think Mark does his share of inventing and myth-making, but not regarding the fact of Jesus' burial, or even that the tomb was found empty on Sunday morning by his followers. That seems to me, at minimum, to be the core of what we can responsibly say of what happened after the cross. Geza Vermesh, whom I knew well, who's now passed away, in one of his last books called The Resurrection, History and Myth, surveys these various alternative explanations and concludes that none of them stands up to stringent scrutiny, that's a quote, despite our need for some rational scientific explanation. Like so many others, he concludes that historical investigation, given our limited evidence, has reached a dead end, given the contradictory and mythological nature of our evidence, namely the texts of the New Testament. 
But is there a way through this impasse? I think there is. Since the earliest surviving Christian texts are seven letters of Paul, 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Romans, Philippians, and Philemon, and they date to the early 50s AD, 20 years after Jesus' death, it makes sense to give them priority, particularly in our attempting to solve the mystery of what happened after the cross. Not only are these letters the earliest evidence we have, but they come to us firsthand as first-person testimony from one who had direct dealings with Peter, James, and the other apostles. If Gospels were written a generation or more later, when Paul, Peter, and James were dead, and the Romans had shattered the original Jerusalem church following the destruction of the city in 70 AD, they should be considered as secondary evidence, that is, the Gospels. It also comes as a surprise to many people familiar with the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to learn that all four are anonymous productions written in the generation after the apostles and based on a complex mix of sources and theological editing, and I might add, myth-making. Scholars are agreed that none of the Gospels is an eyewitness account, and the names associated with them are assigned by tradition. In other words, when we say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're not really talking about those individuals writing these writings, but we're naming the names that became associated with those books in the second century. In other words, the books don't claim any authors by name. So what we find is the names themselves are added as titles to each book, but they're not embedded in the texts of the works themselves. And this is true in all of our copies. Now, there's none of them start saying, I Mark, or I Matthew, am putting down this material. Now, whoever wrote Luke Acts does use the word I, but the author doesn't identify himself, at least though he's more personal. It's not just a generic account, although it does then revert to the third person, generally speaking. There is a section in the book of Acts where the author uses we, the we sections, and we call it the we source, but we're not sure it's the author that's the we. It might be a source that he incorporated. But anyway, each gospel writer had his own motives and purposes in telling the Jesus story in a way that supported his, and I might even say her, particular perspectives. Because, you know, one of the gospels could have been written by a woman, conceivably. None of them is writing history, but all four can rightly be called theologians. From a distance, their differences might seem minimal, but once carefully examined, they are quite significant, revealing a process of myth-making that went on within decades of Jesus' death. Of the four Gospels, Mark, not Matthew, comes first, written sometime maybe around 70 or 80 or later, A.D. Mark gives no account of Jesus' birth at all, miraculous or otherwise, and most strikingly, in his original version, as we will see, there are no post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to the disciples. And I want an exclamation mark there. I mean, that's amazing. This fact alone provides us with an important key to unraveling the mystery surrounding the empty tomb. The author of Mark preserves for us a stage of history when the Jesus story was being told with an entirely different ending. This is not your Easter morning service. Matthew was written at least a decade or more later, after Mark, and the author of Matthew uses Mark as his main source. He does not start from scratch, and he obviously does not have his own independent account to offer. Matthew incorporates 90% of Mark, but he edits Mark's material rather freely, 
embellishing and expanding the story as fits his purposes. That is why most readers of the New Testament who begin with Matthew and then come to Mark have the strange sense that they've already read the story before. They actually have, but in an expanded, edited version of Matthew. It's literally a new edition of Mark. It's overwritten. It's rewritten Mark. The unfortunate result is that many people, when they get to Mark after reading Matthew, think of it as a cut-down version of a more complete story in Matthew. I get emails all the time by Matthew fans, and they really believe that Matthew is more original than Mark. And I can tell you, when you really compare verse by verse every single passage where Matthew's rewriting Mark, it's very clear Mark comes first and Matthew is embellishing. Matthew's additions, rewrites, embellishments are many, but most particularly, he finds Mark's beginning and ending wholly unsatisfactory. How could one possibly write a gospel of Jesus Christ with no birth story of Jesus and no appearances of Jesus to the disciples after the resurrection? I have a course, as some of you know, and I'll put it in the uh, description and I'll put it up on the screen here too, where you can take a look at it on the gospel of Mark. And I call the course Creating Jesus why Mark's gospel was forgotten. And many would say, well, what do you mean forgotten? We've got it in the Bible. But as I just explained, you know, people don't pay attention to it because they think it's derivative of Matthew, which it's not. Think about what this means. For several decades, when there were no other gospels but Mark in circulation, Christians were relating the Jesus story without the two elements that later came to be considered foundational for the Christian faith, Jesus' virgin birth and his Easter morning appearances. I mean, what's more fundamental than those two affirmations to most believing Christians? And yet, Mark doesn't have either of them. Matthew's gospel represents a watershed moment in Christian history. He composes the first account of the miraculous virgin birth of Jesus, and he creates a spectacular scene of resurrection. Listen to this. This is Matthew 28, 2 through 4. And I encourage you to open up to Mark 16 and read the different account of Mark. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Mark doesn't have any guards. He doesn't have sealing of the tomb. He doesn't have an earthquake. He doesn't have the scene of rolling back the stone and so forth. Mark has none of this. In his account, there's no angel but a young man sitting inside Jesus' tomb and no miraculous intervention from heaven. Matthew ends his story with a dramatic scene of the resurrected Jesus meeting the apostles on a mountain in the Galilee and giving the so-called Great Commission to preach the gospel to all nations and baptize them, get this, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And yet we know early on that some copies of Matthew did not even have that commission. You can tell liturgically to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, is definitely something that developed later. Luke was written several decades after Matthew, perhaps at the end of the first century or the beginning of the second, and the author expands and embellishes the core Mark story even further than Matthew had done. Luke adds multiple appearances of Jesus to various individuals, as well as all the apostles. And like Matthew, he also provides his own version of a virgin birth story. And it's quite different from Matthew. Even with these later embellishments, 
Luke and Matthew nonetheless provide us with an unexpected surprise discovered by scholars over 150 years ago. In addition to Mark, both writers, Matthew and Luke, had access to another source, a saying source, usually called the Q source. This early collection of the sayings of Jesus, probably compiled around 50 CE or AD, was apparently not known to Mark. It's defined as the material that Matthew and Luke have in common that they didn't get from Mark. It can be extracted and reconstructed with some degree of certainty. But we don't have an independent copy of Q itself. We can go to Matthew and get his version and Luke and get his version and compare them side by side. And there are all kinds of theories about was it an external source or did one of them have it and the other adapted it from that or what? But either way, the material is not in Mark. But guess what? This two-source material shared by Matthew and Luke that's not in Mark never speaks of Jesus' resurrection. Whereas in Mark, who comes later, Jesus refers several times to being raised on the third day. This is one more example how putting our sources in proper chronological order might enable us to reconstruct the ways in which faith in Jesus' resurrection developed in the first few decades of the movement. Most scholars place the Gospel of John as the latest of the four Gospels, and certainly it is the most theologically embellished in terms of its view of Jesus as the divine preexistent Son of God, or Logos, as he calls it in Greek in the opening verses. So far as the empty tomb and resurrection of Jesus are concerned, John, like Luke, recounts multiple appearances of Jesus to his disciples in Jerusalem, as well as an appended final chapter, John 21, in which Jesus also appears to several of them on the Sea of Galilee. All of this disassembly, sorting, and sifting might suggest historians are just picking and choosing at random whatever suits them to support a preconceived theory, but there's a definite method to this critical historical investigation. Historians of any period have a similar challenge in evaluating the reliability of multiple sources. What is required is that one be explicit and clear about one's methods with careful arguments as to why this or that bit of evidence is given whatever weight. What is needed is a synthesis of our best evidence, incorporating the essential clues that Paul provides for probing a series of related questions. So here are the three questions that I will handle in the next episode. Why? was Jesus' tomb found empty, as Mark says. What happened to the body of Jesus? Mark says it was gone. And how did his earliest followers understand his resurrection? The young man in the tomb, and Mark says, he's risen, or literally, he's been lifted up, he's not here, you're going to see him in Galilee. Take care, everyone, to be continued.